Uh, hey everyone, welcome back. Another episode of Talking Success. Um, I'm, uh, I'm I'm joined today by a chap that I hadn't met really before uh, until uh, I was in a bar the other night uh, after an event and got chatting to this guy. Um, that sounds that sounds a bit crude, actually, but actually we, we were at the same event and it was a very small event hosted by Visa, uh, talking about blockchain and talking about um, some investment that's coming through uh, on, on, on Gideon's side, and I'll introduce you in, in, to him in a minute. And I, I didn't get a chance to talk to him at the event, uh, although there was only about 30 people there. But um, afterwards in the bar, we, we, we'd had a couple of drinks and uh, we got chatting about, well, all things blockchain, all things investment, and also all things podcasts. So uh, and Gideon's kind of a, um, a bit of a pro when it comes to podcasts. So um, I'm expecting an epic episode here. Um, <laughs> As usual, this is completely unscripted. Uh, I've got a couple of things that I definitely want to pick uh, Gideon's brain about um, and probably delve into the world of Web3 and blockchain uh, and then find out a little bit more about what's going on across the continent. So uh, let me hand over to Gideon. He can give you a quick intro in terms of who he is, uh, what he does here in, uh, in in South Africa or the broader Africa, and then... Uh, we can start chatting. So Gideon, um, nice to see you again. Um, I know we don't have necessarily a beer in our hand, but uh, we, we can make do, right, for an hour. So uh, <laughs> over to you. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Darren. Happy to be here. And I think uh, maybe that's one for the future is to have uh, a podcast series where you have to drink beer, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just to keep it more casual and to, to keep, uh, keep some secrets coming out from your hosts. Who knows? Yeah, well, we won't go as far as uh, what Elon Musk did. You know, I think that's probably taking it a little bit too far. Yeah, but, uh, yeah maybe, maybe a beer will be all right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Darren, so introduction on myself is uh, my name is Gideon. As you said, um, I grew up in South Africa. Um, I uh, sort of had a, uh, let's say, sales and marketing background growing up when I started my professional career uh, and then went into an entrepreneurship or started the entrepreneurial journey, starting my own business, which was extremely fun. It was a roller coaster, lots of ups, lots of downs. Uh, it was very difficult to raise money. I think back then the venture capital landscape was very immature. Um, I really struggled to, you know, I think I think a lot of aspiring young South African entrepreneurs benchmark their success on the developed markets, the Western markets, and in particularly the U.S. So that's what I thought it was going to be like. It wasn't like that. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, pitched to many VCs. Most said no. VCs didn't really exist back then. It was mainly PEs. So sold my car and bootstrapped and eventually did get funding. And the business was eventually acquired. And then worked in some other sort of leadership roles. Had a venture builder, had a startup in New York. Um, but ever since I pitched my, to, to my very first VC, I said, I want to be on that side of the curtain. Um, and long story short, that led me to where I am today, which is essentially uh, in charge of the African division of a Swiss company in charge of their blockchain fund. So it's a, it's a company called CVVC. They're a global business, but they're based out of Switzerland. And they, they invest in startups that utilize blockchain to so their venture capital firm, but their niche in the market is Web3 startups. Um, and then they launched Africa two years ago and they hired me to expand the business in Africa, to launch it, uh, to raise capital from various LPs, to you know, generate a pipeline of deal flow, to invest in quality startups on the continent. And, um, you know, lots has happened since then. Um, and we've invested in startups in Egypt and Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, you know, all within that Web3 realm. Wow. Um, and there's more to it than that, of course, but that's the, the quick summary of, you know, who I am and, and what I'm up to. That's awesome. So how, how are you finding kind of, I know you've done it for a long time now, but that sort of crossover to sort of the, the VC side of the fence. Um, <laughs> was, it, was it quite an eye opener? Was, it, was there a lot to learn? Um, given you've been through that sort of, entrepreneurial journey and, and exited a business um, and seen it from a seller's perspective. Um, did you get more of an insight sort of now moving on to uh, sort of the, the VC angle? Definitely huge. And I remember when I was uh, an entrepreneur, I would engage with a lot of investors and, and most of them come from a financial background. You know, they come from finance, investment banking, they CFAs, CAs, that sort of thing. And I always found that was quite an interesting journey to 
becoming an investor. Um, not, not to say that you can't be successful on the back of that because many of some of the best investors in the world are. Um, but I, I just think there's a, there's always a, a separate talent as an, as, as experiencing or being an entrepreneur and experiencing what it's like to start your own business. I think it's a separate sort of talent where you can understand and see what that recipe is to success. No, no one's got a crystal ball. No one can tell the future. But if you can mitigate your risk and you can pick the right founders, especially if you're early stage um, a venture capital firm or early stage investor, then you know the the potential for returns are massive. Uh, the risk is very high, obviously being early stage. But if you can get a couple hundred X's in your portfolio, I mean that's that's a game changer, right? So I think I've because I've been through the journey and I didn't sell a unicorn, right? But I went through the journey, I think there's a sort of recipe to getting to that stage and I bootstrapped and I struggled. So it wasn't an easy process and it became easier as I grew. But I think I definitely sort sort of can understand that recipe for success, um, you know, within the, within the uh, entrepreneurial journey. And for me, one of the big things that stands out is, 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 meeting an entrepreneur where you can see that they are emotionally attached to their product or their service and they view it as an extension of themselves. Um, mm. So you, you'll often find when you're speaking with entrepreneurs uh, or founders, if you, if you point holes in their, you know, in, in their thesis or in their, in their pitch deck or their model, sometimes you would see that they get a bit touched by that or a bit personal or, or even a bit aggressive. And that's not a bad thing. It just means they're really, you know, passionate about what they do and they back themselves. Um, not to say they shouldn't listen to advice, um, but I think the recipe for excess, one of them at least, is to look at a founder that views their business as an extension of themselves because that type of person is going to be someone that perseveres when times are tough, uh, that believes, them, believes in what they do when others don't, and can also pivot uh, when the market says this product doesn't work for this timing or just the market's not big enough and they can adapt and pivot and, and, and sort of, you know, persevere. And Africa is a great market for that. We have some of the best hustlers in the world, especially in Nigeria. And, and, and resilience as well. Uh, exactly. I think the one thing that struck me, uh, you know, I've, I've lived here a decade as everyone knows that's listened to this. I keep harping on about that, but um, I, I like to say that I am kind of almost South African. I was supporting the box the other night, by the way. Um, and, nice. um, yeah, I think one of the things I've noticed here is the resilience, okay? And, and that comes in all different forms. Obviously, we've had COVID and we've had droughts and we've had this and we've had that and we've got, you know, corruption and everything else that's sort of going on in the world. But, you know, South Africans are probably the most resilient people I've met. Uh, and, and particularly in business, I know there's, there's lots of uh, founders that have had to pivot businesses because, you know, one thing hasn't quite worked. And rather than just giving up, um, I go, okay, well, listen, we've got the foundations, we can, we can actually adapt and we can pivot and we can move into a different market or offer a different product. Um, and, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, a great thing to see. And uh, clearly, you know, you guys, and I'll put sort of VCs into a bucket here, but you, you invest in, in people, uh, ultimately, right? The business is the business, that's fine. But it's people that actually set these business up that run them um that you know work 24 hours a day seven days a week you know is, uh, on many occasions kind of you know put family and other life to to the to the side and just focus on the business so um yeah I, as i said it's a it's hugely exciting kind of continent um i can say the same certainly for you know the people i know in kenya who've had to do exactly the same and and, and nigeria so uh, so that's all great um before we go into the world of blockchain and Web3, uh, in terms of the investments that you guys make in startups, um, you mentioned it was early stage. What stage are we talking? Sort of pre-seed, seed, series A? Where, where, where do you play? Yeah. I mean, just to comment on what you said about early stage, I think the people become more important at the, depending on the stage of uh, the type of investor that you are. So if you're a very early stage investor, the people are almost everything, right? I mean, you get these incubation yeah. programs that are, that are, uh, um, that accept startups that are in the, in their idea phase or are in ideation, like Antler. Um, there's my, there's my daughter wanting to get involved in the podcast. Um, and, um, a, a, and you can imagine a startup that it's in its idea phase. It, what's most important is the people and the founders, right? And then when you get to that series, you know, BC private equity level, 
Um, you can swap out the CEOs. You can change the C-level staff. Obviously, not simple, not as simple as that. You still need to have great leaders in the business, but it, it's not as important as being an early stage investor. So we're an early stage investor. Our thesis is to is uh, multifaceted. We have um, we do direct investments. So we invest in startups that are going through their pre-seed or seed round. And then we also do, uh, we have an acceleration program where we invest in startups, sort of Y Combinator model, $135,000, 7%. They go through a 12-week program where they're getting exposure to experts and mentors and various courses that can sort of propel them into that next level. They pitch to investors to raise that pre-seed seed round beyond our uh, program. So that's sort of the core space that we play in. So we're an early stage VC. Okay. All right. Fine. Um, let's talk about the, I don't want to say that the portfolio, I mean, you're more than welcome to mention sort of any companies that you've uh, specifically invested in. Um, but let, let's talk about sort of Web3 and, and blockchain, right? Because that that's clearly, you know, your market. Um, that's where you guys invest in. Um, what does it mean? <laughs> uh, sorry, that's a bit that's a bit broad, right? But Web3 web and blockchain, uh, let, let, let's take them. I think they're two quite different things. Um, yeah. Let's take blockchain first. Uh you know, for people that are sort of tuning in, that are tuning in that, you know, have heard blockchain, understand, you know, a little bit about it, but perhaps tie it directly to, to sort of cryptocurrencies, because it tends to be, you know, um, sort of bucketed with, you know, crypto and blockchain. Um, can, can you give us a, a very sort of high level overview of what blockchain is um, and some of the utilizations for it here in Africa? Sure. So, I mean, when I was exploring, I invested in Bitcoin back in 2016, and that sort of took me down the rock blockchain rabbit hole. It took me a long time to really wrap my head around it because it is quite an intricate technology. And I remember YouTubing things and reading books, and no one really explained it well to me, to be honest, and it really pissed me off. You know, I, I, I just wanted the layman example so I could start wrapping my head around the use cases. Um, and I'll get to what, what blockchain is for me, and hopefully I can give you a, a very simple and layman use case that everyone listening can understand, or rather example of what it is. Um, but if you think about it like this, if, you, if, if, the, if um, the internet comes out, um, you don't need to necessarily explain how the internet works for you to understand the use cases beyond it. You don't need to explain why me and you can interact right now. Um, you know, we're doing it uh, by the internet, essentially, right? We don't need to explain that to someone. Um, that's not paramount for uh, getting users to use the product and the service. You more wanted to have a strong use case that can be adopted quickly and have U a UX and UI where blockchain isn't at the forefront. And we're still at that stage, I believe, where blockchain is still too much at the forefront, very confusing to interact with. There's only a, a small set of individuals that can connect their MetaMask wallet and, and do all the intricate things. But for me, blockchain is essentially a decentralized database where you can store and move data immutably so that anything that's on chain cannot be changed and where there's a lot of transparency. And especially on these public chains, which the majority of them are, you can go and see where who's been moving around this data. And that data can be capital, right? Or in the form of stable coins, uh, or it could be NFTs, or it could be other things as well. Um, and now I think in general, the developed market puts a lot of focus on the speculative side of the crypto economy. And I think that's also because it came about at the same time where retail investors um, are starting to take control of the market and are starting to dictate price action. And that wasn't only seen in crypto, because it's very unregulated um, and and you can manipulate it. But we've also seen that in the likes of investing in listed regulated stocks. We've seen yeah. that with the whole Robin Hood saga um, when you know a lot of those, let's say, DGENs were investing into AMC and BlackBerry and various other stocks and they were manipulating it. And it wasn't based on the performance of the company at all. When in the past, you couldn't actually have access to to invest into stocks like that, not as easily as you can today. Today, you can download the Robinhood app. I'm yep. using Robinhood as an example. There's various others, obviously. And you can decide to invest in company X, company Y. You can do it very easily, very quickly, and you can invest $5 or 
or five or, or in South Africa, five rand, right? Mm-hmm. Where in the past you'd have to go through a broker and it's a bit of a more complicated process. So I think crypto came about at the same time when it was very easy to start uh, purchasing these assets mixed with it also being um, quite volatile because of it being a new asset class and not being regulated. Um, so as I was saying, the developed markets focus mainly on the speculative side of the crypto economy, a lot of like wealth creation and DeFi applications that are highly complex um, and are only tailored towards a niche audience. But I think Africa yeah. is focusing more on the true use cases. And that's because this technology promotes a lot of trust and transparency, two things of which African governments do not have, um, you know, to put it lightly. Um, and also, the, just generally in Africa, there's a lot of infrastructure that's missing that blockchain can solve. So a lot of on- these resilient entrepreneurs that we're speaking of uh, are seeing the opportunity that blockchain can solve very uh, pertinent problems to em- that are relevant to emerging markets like Africa. So a good example would be one of our portfolio companies, which is called House Africa, and they're verifying property on chain. So they're putting the title deeds on a decentralized database where you can see who the true owner is. So once you put that title deed on chain, um, it cannot be changed. So if you made a spelling error of who the owner is, then it will forever be like that, unfortunately. But it can never be changed. It's immutable, and you know exactly who the true owner is. Now, whilst that's a pretty obvious use case, as it, use case and it was one of the use cases that a lot of professors would speak about in the early days of of blockchain and when people were analyzing bitcoin and what it could become and what the technology could be used for it hasn't really successfully been rolled out in developed markets yet because it's not at in their priority list to do this they don't have these sort of problems uh, where in africa you do and that's where you have that leapfrog event where we're able to adopt certain technologies a lot quicker. And we've seen that with mobile phones as well. Yeah. So, so you've got a scenario where we may, we may be able to be the pioneers when it comes to verifying property on chain. In Nigeria, 60% of court cases uh, are attributed to land disputes. So it shows you how much of a big problem it is yeah. there. The, one of the founders, there's two founders in this company called House Africa. He paid $18,000. Um, so he experienced this himself. He paid $18,000 deposit to a um, to a seller that wasn't the rightful seller of this property and he lost his money. And in Nigeria, if you look out for it, and when you're in the suburban area, you'll see um, signs that says this property is not for sale or you'll see paint even uh, expressing that. Um, so that's not a problem that, 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 that you would see in a developed market like Switzerland or Japan. That being said, everyone has to update their technology eventually from example, you know, writing letters to to emails, they'll all have to upgrade it eventually. And you could argue that we would have done it before them and we might be able to even export our technologies to to develop markets at that stage. Who knows, right? Um, So that's one of the use cases. Another great use case that I really like to talk about is, and I haven't seen this yet, and I think that's because there's a big knowledge gap between Web 2 and Web 3 um, uh, that needs to sort of be closed and we do need endorsement of the legacy world, corporates, policymakers, and government. But 25% of the continent's GDP is lost to corruption and to fraud. That's a lot of money, right? Um, yeah. If, you know, if, 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 if uh, we could get some of that back, it would be transformative for the continent. The majority of those lost funds are due to poor tender and, and, and procurement processes and I'm sure if anyone's listening from Africa, I'm sure you all know about at least South Africa. We have this term called tenderpreneur, you know, which is uh, dodgy entrepreneurs that take advantage of tender processes because they have mates within within the government that are issuing these tenders. A lot of backhands going on and so forth. Long story short, if you could have a, a government endorsed application that tracked and traced all the funds, all the tenders and all the procurement processes then us as the, as the taxpayers would be able to sit at home because we're the ones actually paying for this, right? I mean, it's our money that's being utilized to fix the roads or to develop better education and schooling systems, for example. Um, and why are we paying tax, right? If 25% of the, of, of the continent's GDP is lost, it's crazy. Um, on, on a public chain, as a taxpaying citizen, you should be able to go onto a platform, look at who, the one, who won the tenders, how much was awarded and what they did with the money. Uh, and then you would, you would 
over time as that application matures and we you know iterate it over time you would you would start to eradicate fraud across the continent we very hard to do that so that's another you know good use case last thing i'll say is just like the difference between crypto web3 and blockchain simply put you know crypto is the tokens the the you know the the use of cryptography to create tokens and coins um blockchain is what i mentioned earlier the, you know the de- decentralized ledger technology as it's known to be dlt and then web3 is more sort of the narrative around being able to monetize your own data through blockchain and and crypto so whilst they all sort of married they can be separate and they're not the same thing Scott, could you design a video game? I could make you a hypothetical one. If I took some random genres, mechanics, maybe blended them together and uh, created a new hypothetical game. Now that would make a great podcast. Undoubtedly. So what would you make? Something original and exciting? A Dark Souls city builder? A co-op roguelike? Everything. All of that. You know, we could use the Nemesis system from a, and put it in a first-person shooter. And we could have a loot system with survival mechanics and, and motion controls. And maybe you could... Oh, I don't know, it's save a kingdom from some out of control toasters. You know, uh, what about party? Catch the Gaming Blender on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thank you. Well, that, that's clarified, certainly for me, quite a few aspects. Um, now, without getting into politics, because I don't do politics, um, I think the user case you mentioned is, is great in theory. But there's clearly going to be a bit of um, a blockage from uh, governments across Definitely. the continent that don't necessarily want this technology for obvious reasons. Um, do you see that being as quite uh, being quite a significant barrier to, to, to a solution like the one you were talking about? Definitely. I mean, you know, we, we're not the entrepreneurs that are going there and pushing out these applications, but we've heard of stories and we've seen scenarios where it's not being widely adopted because of that for two reasons. One, as I mentioned, it's just the knowledge gap. I think there's still a lot of education that needs to be done in the legacy world, the Web2 world. And I think hopefully sort of this next bull run might uh, uh, excel or propel um, how this technology is adopted and understood. It's not just a means to buy drugs on, on Silk, on, online, on Silk Road, that website that was created many years ago. Um, so uh, I think that... Um, one of the things, so, so to answer your question, no, it, I, I don't think there are certain governments that if they understood exactly how this technology worked and they were doing dodgy things, why would they want it to be transparent, right? Um, that being said, I think if it's widely adopted by um, the population and also large corporates, it would put a lot of pressure on government to do that. Um, another way that you could... Uh, put pressure on the ruling party or, or, or a president or a, a governing body is to align yourselves as an app. If you're a sort of start founder thinking of building an application is to allow, align yourselves with the opposing parties, educate them on, on how your application can make a difference in your community and then encourage the opposing party to use it as part of their political campaign to say, yeah. for example, if we were put into power, we would make voting completely transparent and everyone would be able to know, you know, voting would become digitized. It will become on chain. Politicians will figure out how to say it in a nice way that doesn't confuse people. Basically they'll stop corruption and they can use it as part of the campaign to say, we'll implement blockchain if we come into power. So I think naturally it will eventually be adopted. It could take two years. It could take 20 years. Who knows? So clearly, it's it's quite a complex piece of technology. Um, and, you know, if we look at adoption and um, leave blockchain to the side for one moment and we look at AI and what's happened in the last 12 months with AI, I mean, literally every service provider I think that we use or that I come across has now got you know, an AI feature. Um, and, they, they, you know, it, it seems to have come from literally nowhere. And I, I appreciate this. There's, there's a lot of work that's been going on in the background. And if you were into sort of AI and you were probably working with the guys at OpenAI or you were working at Google or Microsoft, or Amazon, you, you, you probably have more of an awareness of this than the general public. But from the general public's perspective, and I like to think I'm, I'm, I'm quite tech 
techie um, and I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, this has come from nowhere. An adoption has been boom, like that. Um, but I can't say the same for, for blockchain that I've personally seen or Web3. Or is it a case? Actually, there is adoption, but because it's, it's not a consumer facing layer like AI is, um, it sits in the back uh, and it just does what it does. So can you un unravel that? Is there quite a lot of adoption in lots of areas that we, the Joe public, are not aware of, but we might use it on a, on a daily basis or, or is it not at that point yet? Yeah, I think that's a really good question and it's very insightful. Um, I think you can definitely see sort of foster adoption amongst retailers, uh, you know, retail investors or just general citizens um, to, to understand AI, to maybe start interacting with it and understanding the use cases of it. Where blockchain, I think, is a more complex technology. Um, and the way I sort of see blockchain is it's almost the infrastructure layer of which applications are built on top of. Um, AI arguably is the same, right? You can build an application utilizing ChatGPT or OpenAI's API, um, but it is way more easy to, to wrap your head around. Uh, as a layman, even if you're fascinated about technology, um, my dad, for example, um, he, can inter he has been interacting with you know, ChatGPT uh, for various things. Come up with a curry recipe, um, you know, what, what should I message my girlfriend for Valentine's Day, whatever it may be. It's a lot easier yeah. to just start interacting with. Um, and you can understand where that might, uh, I think for the general public, you know, that, that could translate to, you know, having a, a, a personal assistant on your phone where you could just send a voice note to and ask it, you know, or, or, or the uh, robotic him or her or it or was or stud muffin or whatever they say these days to book you a flight, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can really understand how that can easily start happening. Um, uh, so I think blockchain is just it's very complex. So the way I see blockchain now it, in, in terms of where we are with the technology, the first sort of people, the way that I'd like to explain it, is the first sort of people that adopted this technology were the Steve Wozniaks, right? So, of course, if you're very young and you don't know who Steve Jobs is and you don't know the Apple story, you, know, you, get, you have Steve Jobs and you st Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs being the visionary and the commercial marketing genius behind Apple, and Steve Wozniak being the techie, the nerd, um, you know, and the one that sort of uh, built the technology of Apple in the early days. So the first people to adopt blockchain are the Steve Wozniaks. They're the early adopters because they are sort of the geeks and the nerds, and we need those people, and they, they're able to grasp the concepts of it very quickly. But then they, they also now are the ones that are building the applications that are not very easy to use because it hasn't been adopted yet by the Steve Jobses. So we are starting to see the, the space mature where the Steve Wozniaks are partnering up with the Steve Jobs, Steve Jobses of this world. And you're starting to see products that are more accessible, that can attract a wider audience, have a stronger commercial model behind it, and have a simple UX and UI. There's nothing, I mean, no one likes to interact with a product that is confusing or hard to use. The only reason you would ever do that is because it is solving a gigantic problem that cannot be solved anywhere else, or there's a way to make money out of it. You know, hence these DeFi protocols, some of these DeFi protocols where you can, um, you, know, you know, stake your, your assets on there. Uh, they're intensely complicated, but people have taken the time to learn it because they believe they can generate yield out of it. So those are really the only two reasons why people have taken the time to go through it. But ideally, at the end of the day, you know, you, you want to be able to, you know, House Africa, for example, they, they've got this, the verification layer or protocol that they've developed. And then on top of that, they've developed a marketplace. So uh, two prominent sort of property marketplaces would be Property24 in South Africa or Zillow in the US. And they've developed a, a property marketplace where you can now interact and look into various uh, properties that you know have been verified. And no one, they just know it's verified. They don't need to know it's on chain, right? They just know that it's a trusted company, House Africa. You can interact with properties on their platform and you know that everything that, that you're interacting with or whoever you're speaking to or the products or rather the properties that are being marketed are being sold by the rightful, rightful owner. 
Um, but blockchain is not at the forefront of that application, right? Well, well that's it from a, from a consumer perspective. You wouldn't know it was there, would you? I mean, it's behind the scenes. It's the data. It's effectively the database. Um, but you wouldn't know it was there. I think one of the one of the early things I saw, um, which again was um, seamless, was you know contracts, smart contracts. Uh, you know, to have that on a blockchain where there can be no argument from your customer or whoever to say, oh no, we didn't sign that, or no, we didn't see that. Um, you know, it's on the blockchain. It's 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 you know it's documented. It, can't be argued with um it is what it is and it's black and white uh and i, I felt that was that was a, a very sort of easy simple concept to grasp so i've got a contract and i want to make sure that you know it's 100 percent um legitimate and everyone signed it and what have you and it's there uh and it's visible to everyone um can we just talk about web3 for a minute uh in terms of the the the, the difference between blockchain and web3 um, and without sort of going into the world of DeFi, because like you quite rightly said, it's it's bloody complex. Um, I've tried to get my head around it, and I, you know, and I'm a, I'm a fintech nerd, and I'm still struggling, right? So, um, can can we talk about Web three? And then I've got some some sort of questions to ask you more about sort of starting a business and uh, sort of incubating something using these technologies. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so so some of the use cases around Web three. Anyone that that owns data or is exposed or is a product should the ideas should start being rewarded by being the product so i think there's still a long way for this to go and for it to be adopted and for it to be used efficiently but some examples of something in the market and a lot of people might know this one that are crypto savvy or, or you know enjoy looking into the space is a business called or token called basic attention token and they have a browser called brave um, which is which has got like a little line on it, um, and it's very secure and so on. Um, but anyway, if you're interacting on that browser and you start seeing advertising pop up like you do on Google, you actually start getting rewarded in basic attention token because you are the product. So you start getting a portion of that revenue. Um, you are the data, right? I mean, like Facebook monetizes us. We are the data. We're the product for Facebook. But we don't get rewarded um, from that at all. Um uh, so that's one of the, the examples. Another example is, I don't even know if these guys are still out there, but in the early days of crypto, there was a startup called Steemit, and they were basically like the Facebook or MySpace of, of crypto. And you would, every time you produced content on there or wrote a blog or something like that, then uh, you would get paid in their, in their um, native token. And then every time it got upvoted, so the more exposure it got on the platform, then you would also get paid you would get paid more as well. And then you can start thinking about it even more complex is um, you could start um, putting people's data on a marketplace that could start getting paid for. So if you wanted to give Africans who don't have access to um, credit, because they don't have access to credit or loans because they don't have a credit record, um, you could then pull data from mobile money applications because the way that they are interacting in the moment in the market now, although they don't have a bank account or they don't have a credit record, is they're utilizing mobile money applications. So if you built an application that integrated with all the mobile money applications and built a credit record of a specific person, then you could also put that on a marketplace and you could sell that data um, to, uh, to to large financial institutions and banks which would give them access to credit because now they have a credit record. Um, and then it would re reward the person whose data that you're taking through tokens. And you're able to utilize, do that efficiently through smart contracts um, and mm -hmm. seamlessly. So it's not a process of signing things and, oh, by the way, we owe you money. You know, like a, another very sweet example of a smart contract use case is if you're going to the airport, you book a flight and you want to pay for, you when you're checking out, on travel start, for example, and you and you want to and you get prompted to pay for travel insurance in case your flight gets canceled, cancelled or something like that. Um, you pay the extra hundred rand or ten dollars or whatever it may be. You're at the airport, your flight gets cancelled, um, and now it's a process for you to now claim to get that back. Um, if that was all on chain, I mean, it would be in the background, right? The user wouldn't even know. The smart contract would automatically just 
you know, it, once it will be integrated with the um, the airport's sort of API, and it would know that the the flight is delayed or the flight has been cancelled. And once it picks up on that data, it will execute the smart contract and reimburse you the, 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 the money for the flight. It's just a more efficient way of how things are already done, basically. Okay, um, well, it makes complete sense. Um, so, if if, if you, we've got people listening to to this podcast who are have an idea, um, actually, maybe even have a, a business running at the moment, a, an online business or a digital business or, or, or whatever it may be, and are looking at um, you know the sort of evolution, um, how do they improve their product or how do they get their product to market? What sort of technologies could they use? Should they use, etc. If they were to uh, consider blockchain, uh, we'll leave Web3 for the time being, but they've considered blockchain as kind of part of their architecture. Uh, given it is a new technology, a, a few years, but it's still new, um, how easy or difficult is it for people that, um, I, I'm going to use tech founders, right? Because I think if, you, if you're a non-tech founder, doing anything sort of technical is, is a challenge, right? So. Uh, if you're building a business or want to pivot your business um, or have an idea, et cetera, how easy is it to get into the world of blockchain? Um, is there talent available? Um, is it very, very expensive? You know, we've seen, you know, some of the uh, the crypto companies, you know, over in the States that, you know, for, for Solidium developers are paying, you know, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars a year to these people. Right. So mm -hmm. um, is this, again, a big barrier to mass adoption and mass deployment of these types of technologies? The lack of talent? Um, what, what is that? Yeah, say? I mean, supply and demand, right? There's so many, there's so little developers out there, so they're very expensive. But there is a lot of uh, concerted effort amongst various organizations to educate developers across the globe, also in Africa. So I think they will start becoming more cheaper. Um, you know, it's the same with machine learning engineers as well. They're super expensive at the moment, also because of the hype. Um, but I, I, it's not impossible now. Uh, firstly, utilize AI. So if you have an idea, just ask GPT or, or ask, you know, Claude from Anthropic or Google Bard or any of the other AI chatbots. Um, my idea is to solve this problem. What are blockchain use cases that can come up with this? It's a great brainstorming tool just to get the mind thinking about how blockchain could, can, can work and how it can be applied. Um, and also, because the space is maturing, the barriers to entry to building an application on chain are lowering. Uh, there are applications now or protocols coming out now where um, they sort of the WordPress of Web3. So, for example, there's a company called Ford Protocol, uh, and they've got this product called Ford Factory, and it's very easy to use. Don't let the word <clears throat> protocol and blockchain and crypto scare you. Um, you can go onto their website, you can go onto Ford Factory, and you can deploy an application on-chain utilizing their, uh, you know, their infrastructure. You know, you can think of it as like e-commerce. Back in the day, it was very difficult to generate to bring up an e-commerce store and have a payment platform. But then things like Shopify came out and made that easier. And for deploying websites, things like WordPress came out. Um, so that's what Ford Factory is doing. If you wanted to just, if you had an idea and you wanted to validate it before spending money and raising money to find a co-founder um, who might be the, the tech person in the business, you can utilize these tools like Ford Factory on Ford Protocol. Question for you then. And this was a conversation I had with someone else, I think, last week. Um, so we, we've seen this explosion of AI companies. Um, and a lot of them are basically a, um, a window into open AI. OK, so they're kind of a face. And they go, oh, we can you know, do PowerPoint presentations or we can write a blog or we can do this and we can do that. But when you lift sort of you lift the bonnet, um, Effectively, you're just using a, a you know a, an open AI engine or an LLM en engine. Okay, so what you're seeing on top is like a layer. Um, is there value to that from a VC perspective, um, or is there not because you don't own the the, the actual technology behind that? Um, where, 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 I was just as you were talking about um, sort of blockchain as a service. Uh, I, I just thought maybe that's again a, a consideration or something. That, for people to think about, you know, if you are building a business that you want to, uh, you know, eventually sell or really scale, um, you know, do you need to consider the underlying technology and who, who owns that IP? Web3 
Whether you're a seasoned podcaster or just thinking of starting a podcast, you need to listen to Buzzcast from the folks at Buzzsprout. Here we go. Buzzcast covers everything a podcaster should know from marketing strategies and how to make money from your podcast to the latest and greatest tech and industry insights to keep you on the cutting edge. Follow Buzzcast by clicking the link in the description or go to buzzcast.buzzsprout.com and keep podcasting. I think you do. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if, if the barriers to entry for other startups are very high and they can't replicate what you've built, of course, that, that makes you more valuable. Um, that being said, it's also very expensive and very difficult to build things on your own. So if you wanted to build an application using OpenAI's API, um, it's much easier to go that route versus, you know, building your own, uh, you know, language learning model, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I think there is exceptions to that. And at the end of the day, there's so many cool use cases on OpenAI. Um, once, you, once you build your sort of application layer on top of OpenAI, you can also develop your own code on beyond that. So you can improve it. So if you wanted to develop like a, uh, um, a, um, uh, an AI fitness trainer where you plug in all the data about, your, about yourself, your weight, your height, your goals, you want to mar- run, run a marathon or you want to be Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever the case may be, and it yeah. spits out that data, it's not going to look the same as ChatGPT because you've, you've, uh, you've taught it beyond what ChatGPT uh, um, gives you. So you can uh, develop another layer on top of ChatGPT, and it's the same with some of these on-chain capabilities, even like WordPress. WordPress is also the same. And at the end of the day, you're going to start developing a brand depending on, uh, you know, if you're B2B or B2C, and then the brand will have its own value as well. But it definitely is a consideration for sure. If the ba- yeah. barriers to entry are very low in any business, uh, then the value of that company is lower. If I wanted to start an agency today that helps people improve their tweets or their X's, I don't know what they're called now, um, you know, and I would be their social media manager and I had three people and we, that we were a social media agency. Um, to replicate that is exceptionally easy, right? Yeah. Um, so you might have an incredible service and a great brand, but you're not going to be acquired at, uh, you know, 20x your, your, your EBITDA um, just because it's, uh, it's very, uh, the barriers to entry are super low. So I think that can be applied in, in the scenario that you mentioned as well. Yeah, but I, 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 as you're saying, you know, you can't. I don't think anyone can go out. Certainly, in the early stages of a of a startup or or an idea, um, it's going to start building your own sort of blockchain, right? I mean, that's uh, yeah. that's technically very very difficult. Um, takes a long time, and uh, you know, you you need a lot of expertise. So, you know, maybe using one of these platforms as a service offerings, like you you mentioned, and I'll, I'll put some links down here as well. Um, you know, maybe a good route to sort of proof of concept or maybe, you know, until you're at sort of, you know, maybe seed stage where you've got an investment, you can go and then invest in building your own chain and you can sort of bring things in house. So would, it, would that be sort of some of the advice you give, you know, let's get a proof of concept, make sure, you know, there is demand, make sure there's a market for this, um, get it monetized. Uh, and then you can look to, you know, bring things in house and sort of uh, own that IP. Okay. So, moving forward 100 percent, 100 percent. one of the biggest mistakes i made when we we're trying to develop this application in my business was that we could have white labeled so many others where there was a service that you could white label them at a fraction of the cost my business partner and i went to an agency and we got to develop from scratch and it was buggy and it wasn't user friendly and then every time we wanted to make a change it was exceptionally expensive and we haven't we hadn't even validated that idea worked yet so I think at the end of the day, if you're also wanting to raise capital, you just want to show that there's traction, people are purchasing the product, or you're getting more users or more, more merchants, um, and you just want to validate that that this idea is working and there is a market for it. Uh, and then beyond that, you can raise capital and reinvest it into building your own infrastructure, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, that's good advice. Thank you. Um, before I let you go, um, is, is there any sort of uh, other words of wisdom that you'd like to share in terms of, you know, on, entrepreneurs going on this journey? Again, they may be, you know, ideation stage. They actually may be further down the line. Um, you know, the, the, the whole sort of venture market and the private equity market and the whole sort of investment market over the last, 
you know, 12 months or so has, has taken a bit of a nosedive. Um, I think there are signs of a recovery. Um, I'd, I'd like to think there are anyway. There's certainly a bit more confidence back in the market. Um, what, what's your advice to people now going on this journey? Um, and that's quite a broad question, but if, if you were to give them maybe one or two snippets of advice, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, I mean, in general, you know, all, I'm not going to mention all the advice, um, like, you know, persist and don't listen to other people and if you believe in something do it because you can find that on TikTok and instagram you know in the morning when you wake up and you're scrolling you're getting all those motivational quotes but the one thing that i will say from my experience if you are an aspiring entrepreneur and you don't and you want to create a, a large business that is that, that has the opportunity to be funded by venture capital then understand what venture capital is venture capital firm is not going to fund a small business that can only double triple or 10x their value it's, that's never going to happen so for example we're not going to fund a paint shop ever right um because the opportunity for that to 100x um is very very low and the reason vcs have to invest in products that can 100x or in startups that can 100x is because it's very high risk. We're an early stage investor. And because of that, most of the startups we invest in fail. It's just the nature of investing, right? Um, you know, that's why you have other products like mutual funds that invest in listed, listed companies. And, you know, the, the benefits of a venture capital fund, the investors of the fund um, could do exceptionally well if we pick the right startups. But most of the time, because there's a lot of products, it ends up being normalized as another financial product that does between you know 20 and 30% a year because lots of the startups fail, but lots of the startups do 100x. So on the back of that, if you're going into the market to raise capital, venture capital, understand that you have two customers. The one customer that you have is based on the startup that you've got, you know, the product or the service that you have. That's the customer, right? Obviously, understanding that customer is paramount. But the other customer that you have, and this is exceptionally important, and I'm sure aspiring entrepreneurs listening to this would have heard the saying that you're always raising. Um, and that's a, a big role of the CEO is to constantly just bring in, bring in funding is to understand VCs and to understand how the model works. I think it's really important to understand that. The one thing that I thought about now being on the other side of the curtain is if I go back to being an entrepreneur again, if I wanted to pursue that journey, it's, it would be a lot easier for me uh, in the sense that I know what VCs are looking for. At the end of the day, venture capitalists are financial products. They, are, they have to raise money for a fund from high net worth individuals or endowments or family offices or funder funds, uh, and they want their returns, and they get the returns on the back of the, the venture capitalists investing into startups. Um, and so if you start understanding the recipe of how a, a VC works, then you can start talking that language and and selling that narrative and it's going to become 10 times easier for you to to close around and to raise substantial funding so my advice and summary would be just look into venture capital more uh, and to how it works and and how the model works so if you can speak the language of the vc you're pitching to it's going to make your your um odds of success a lot a lot higher i think one of the other things as well is you know vcs aren't all equal um, in terms of, you know, what they invest in, how they invest, um, what sort of terms they look for, what sort of exits they look for, multiples, etc. So, you know, if you are you know, creating a, uh, you know, a, a, um, a business, um, you feel that you want to get, you know, or need to get some VC funding, you do your research. Um, you know, if you've got a, a pharmaceutical product that doesn't sit on a blockchain or Web3, then Gideon's not your man. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you do have a, you know, a, a pharmaceutical company that's doing something on the blockchain um, and using Web3 to monetize people for lab tests or whatever it may be, then he's definitely your man. Um, Gideon, thank you. Um, it was hugely insightful. I've, I've, I've learned a great deal and, and uh, I hope our audience have as well. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, I uh, appreciate you're a busy man. You probably can't answer, answer sort of every request that comes through, but um, link, LinkedIn, the best place or? Uh, yeah, LinkedIn, um, okay. you know, uh, Twitter as well, um, you know, at Gideon Greaves. There's only one that I know of. Uh, which is me. So it's uh, it's just my name and surname, and you'll, you'll find me on Twitter um, or LinkedIn, hundred percent. No, we, I mean, of course, um, we get a lot of startups reaching out to us, um, and it, it does become difficult to engage. 
uh, with all of them, but please do reach out. You know, at the end of the day, we are also passionate about empowering entrepreneurs in Africa to make a difference and to give them the chance to succeed. There is a limited access to venture capital in this early stage environment. So, you know, we, we love what we do and please reach out. Uh, we might not get back to you again, but another word of advice, if you follow up three, four times, we will definitely get back to you. <laughs> there you go, everyone. Right. So uh, Gideon said, basically you drive him mad and you will get a response. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> listen, th thanks so much. Uh, re re really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. So uh, thank you. And uh, I'll see you again at another event sometime soon. I mean, Cape Town in, in, in a few weeks time. So I might grab you for uh, that sort of final beer that I had to miss the other night. Awesome. Good man. Thanks, Darren. I appreciate right. you having me on. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Cheers, Gideon. All right.